The Führer said that he wanted to offer to Britain terms that she could accept with honor. He would make no humiliating demands. Britain would not be obliged to forfeit a single square mile of her territory. Germany was even prepared to guarantee the safety of the British Isles against attack by any other foreign power. Mr. Churchill replied, XPD by Len Dayton, dramatized in eight parts by Michael Bakewell. Episode three, An Egg Farm in Norfolk. Okay, bud, just pour me a scotch and tell me why I had to be dragged away from my chess game. Here, thanks. Or turn up the TV or tune it into the Japanese channel. Didn't you check this boat for bugs? Mm, sure that we did. But why take chances? You chess player? Not seriously. Oh, pity. We play for money, and I was on a winning streak tonight. No, no matter. Tell me a story. Hollis thought he was being tailed. A black 1978 Porsche 928. He saw it at the airport, and it was parked across the road from the office. We thought we'd have a look at the driver. I took Hollis's Datsun, and he drove my BMW. The Porsche fell for the bait and went after him. I followed both of them onto the San Diego freeway. The Porsche suddenly accelerated and Hollis went after it. The lorry cut off my view and when it cleared, there was no sign of them. They'd left the freeway. By the time I'd got back round again, the commuter traffic was starting to build up, so I gave up and came back here. And then? We'd arranged that if we lost one another, Hollis would ring me back here. When the phone rang, I thought it was him. But it was a Sergeant Hernandez telling me that the car had blown up. There was nothing left of Hollis to identify. You didn't get a look at the man in the Porsche? It was too far ahead. Mm, too bad. You think it was a deliberate killing? The police said no other car was involved. Mm, the accident investigation cops have a routine they call A1 follow-up. I don't want you getting tangled up in it. Now, you just make sure you're a Mr. Clean when the Sergeant Hernandez talks with you. Okay. Uh, give me the keys to that kid's ducts and I'll handle that. Now, just forget you ever saw this British kid from the Washington Embassy. Tell the cops you left your car in the marina car park with the key in the ignition. Oh, are there any other keys on the ring? Just the high keys. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Well, at least you did something right. Go through with your dinner with Breslau tomorrow. Don't mention losing your car unless she brings it up. Could be Breslau had a hand in the killing. Hmm, so you're not just a pretty face. Oh, I, uh, I brought this for you. Know how to use it? Point it and pull the trigger? Very good. But you do have to load it first. You'll get the hang of it. Oh, well, I'm going back to my game. Good luck. You realize the guys who sapped that white BMW probably figured you were inside it? Yeah. Can I turn this rubbish off now? Do you think you can manage that on your own? And uh, what line of business are you in, Mr. Stewart? Just at present, Mrs. Breslau, I'm looking for some... Uh, Mr. Stewart is thinking of putting some of his company's money into a film I'm making, uh, my dear. Will you have another spoonful of lemon mousse, Amabel? Oh, it's delicious. I ought to say no, but I can't resist it. Mr. Oh, Stein was actually there, it's you know, lovely. Vincent. Oh, actually where? Uh, more mousse, Mr. Stein. I just try and stop him, Mrs. Breslau. <laughs> Mercus in Turinga. I'm making a film about it. Oh, that place. Uh, Max, w w would you mm -hmm. think it rude of me if I poured a little more of that German wine? No, oh, no, I help yourself. Max, you, you, you must be the last people in Westlake holding out against Californian wines. <laughs> I'm interested to hear you were at Mercus, Mr. Stein. Did you go into the mine itself? Well, that was the place where the treasure was found, Annabel. Oh, was well, it? I can't really? say I did. More is a pity, though. I would like to get my hands on some of that stuff they found there. Uh, Mr. Stein was a friend of the man who first wrote the story. He's going to be a wonderful help to the scriptwriter. Would you like some cheese, Mr. Stein? Thanks, Mrs. Breslow. Uh, that'd be great. But you were actually there, Mr. Stein. Uh, Chuck. Everybody calls me Chuck. Here you are, Mr. Stein. Uh, I was with a quartermaster trucking battalion. Uh, our people moved some of the stuff out of the mine. Have you been able to contact many people who were there, Mr. Breslow? Oh, there are not so many left. It's a long time ago men have died, are sick, have forgotten, or wish to forget. From what I heard, there was not only gold in the mine. There were paintings, mm. rare books, secret documents, yeah. too. Yeah, rare books, yeah. 
uh, German army material, secret government archives, Nazi stuff, and uh, uh, personal documents concerning Hitler himself. How do you know? Uh, I handled some of it, and I saw the inventory sheets. I was an orderly room clerk. They used our mimeograph machine to duplicate the records. Well, now, why don't we all go where we can sit and talk more comfortably? Uh, oh, right. is ready. <clears throat> I'll tell you this. There was stuff in that mine which would destroy your Winston Churchill reputation overnight. <laughs> what was that about Winston Churchill? Rumors, Charles, rumors. Uh -huh. Brandy. Sure, sure. Ah, rumors, perhaps. Yeah, let's all go and sit in the lounge. Oh, that was a divine meal, Mary Louise. Have you ever tasted such delicious poulet au champagne, Mr. Stein? No, ma'am, I never have. Oh, you're so kind. Oh, uh, do sit down, Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Mrs. Brother. And coffee? Thank Everybody? you. Oh, do help yourself to a chocolate, Mr. Stein. Hand-ported brandy mm. cherries from a tiny shop in Munich. Mm, Max used to buy them for me before we were married. <laughs> oh, gee, they're good, huh? <laughs> Well, where do you buy them? Oh, Max has his business partner bring them over from Munich. Oh, he didn't tell me about his business partner in Munich. <laughs> the chocolate-coated cherries are dandy, Mrs. Brazel. <laughs> yes, sir. -y. Well, do have another. Thanks. Uh, did Did you hear that story about them finding Hitler in Sao Paulo? You know, they, they asked him to come back and run Germany. No, he says he, he won't go. So they keep trying to persuade him. They offer him money and anything he wants. It. He, he's got his mortgage almost paid, and a grown-up son and a married daughter by a second wife. Now he, he doesn't want any part of going back to Germany. But finally he gives in. But but before he goes back to be dictator of Germany again, he insists on one thing. Right? <laughs> no more, Mister Nice Guy. <laughs> 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 I got a million of them. I'm sorry we have to go so soon, Mary Louise. It's been lovely. Yeah. Vincent's got a patient first thing in the morning. <laughs> yeah, well, there it is. Good night, Max. So long, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Well, I think it's time I was going on, too. No, no, no. Don't go yet, Mr. Boyd. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Good night. Yeah. Now, stay for another cup of coffee and uh, another glass of something. And we've still got some business to uh, talk over, my dear. Oh, well, I shall only yawn or say something silly, so if you'll excuse me, I'll go right to bed. Of course, Mrs. Breslau. Thank you for a wonderful meal and a truly delightful evening. Well, good night, Mr. Stewart, Mr. Stein. Good night. Good night. And uh, switch the dishwasher off before you come to bed, darling. Yes, of course. Good night. Brandy, Mr. Stewart. Thank you. Charles has something he wants to show us. <clears throat> this uh, here is a, an old wartime document box. German. They uh, made them a metal, so they'd be fireproof. Now, can you read uh, German, Mrs. Stewart? Well enough. Uh -huh. Have you ever heard of Dr. Morell, Dr. Theodore Morell? Hitler's personal physician. Right. Not only Hitler's personal physician, but a man upon whom Hitler totally depended, who went everywhere with him. Now, these here are Dr. Morell's <laughs> medical files on his patient Adolf Hitler. Now you look for yourself, Mr. Stewart. Thanks. Uh, Brandon, Mrs. Stewart. Oh, thanks, Mr. Brother. Charles? Ah, right, thank you. Thanks. Interesting, huh? That's a desk diary, dated from 1936. It shows how Dr. Morrell first met Hitler through Hoffman, Hitler's personal photographer and close friend. Uh, see here how it reads? Hoffman was sick. H.H. are Hoffman's initials, mm -hmm. M.F. is Mein Fuhrer. Look there, see? Met M.F. at Hoffman's house, Munich. M.F. provided his personal aircraft for professional visit to H.H. in his Munich home. Now we come to Morell's first professional opinion of Hitler. Saw M.F. First impression of him shocking. Complains of headaches, stomach pains, also ringing in the ears. <laughs> Neurotic. And these are the details of Morell's first physical examination of Hitler. No abnormalities, papillary reflex is normal, good coordination, normal sensitivity to heat and cold. Scars on leg as a result of a shrapnel wound in 1916, badly mended fracture of left shoulder blade. Good job it wasn't his right, otherwise whatever would have happened to the Nazi salute? <laughs> <laughs> can't tear you away from it, can we? I want to know the end of the story. Did the handsome young doctor cure his famous patient? <laughs> oh, Dr. Morell was fat and ugly. Hitler said that if Morel could cure his eczema and make him better within a year, 
he'd be given a fine house. What happened? Well, Morel pumped Hitler full of a medicine he'd invented himself. For years, he didn't even have a virus infection. Whenever he was going to make a speech, Morel would give him an extra dose of glucose and stuff to pep him up. Now, Hitler was pleased. And no historian has ever seen this material? No one knows that it exists. It was taken to the Kaiserreiter mine. That's what makes it so interesting. Our film, I mean. Yes, of course, the film. Uh, do you have access to other material like this, Mr. Stein? Sure thing. I'm afraid, Mr. Stewart, for better or worse, reputations are going to be turned upside down. Hitler and Churchill, you mean? Drink your coffee and have one of those delicious chocolates, Mr. Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> they really are something. We've done enough for one night. Have a nice evening, Stuart. Have you been waiting here for me all night? No. Do you want to talk in the boat? No, this will do. I'll get into the car. <clears throat> you see, we took the liberty of putting a small device into your cassette player. It tells us where you are. Well, give or take a mile or so. Am I supposed to say thank you? Hey, it could prove a benefit to you someday. Oh, give me a cigarette, will you? I'm trying to give them up. Uh, no matter. London is getting very excited about this caper. The guy sitting in my car is section head for the whole West region. He came in person to brief me about a highly unlikely information source that London have found. He wants you to fly to London tomorrow to go to East Anglia to talk to some geriatric German who, he says, helped load this junk on board a train when they were putting it into the Kaiser of the Mine. Is that what you've come out here in the middle of the night to tell me? Mm, I'm afraid so. This little bastard didn't come out here to consult me. No, no, no. He made it an order. Why the hell didn't he just put it onto the telex? Oh, I still don't understand. California can be very pleasant at this time of year. Ah, that's about the size of it. <laughs> a jaunt for the top brass. It keeps us field men on our toes. Anyway, have a good time. The contact's name is with the airline ticket. Nothing covert about this one. Use your own passport and credit cards and so on, and report to London in the usual way. Oh, and uh, stop worrying about that boy from Washington. It wasn't your fault. I say... Hello? Uh, Excuse me, is this Little Ashfield? <laughs> yeah, this is Little Ashfield. I'm looking for Mr. Franz I'm looking for Franz Vapor's house. Yeah, uh, he'll be in the church. What do you want him for? In the church? <laughs> Polishing, not praying. Every week, regular as clockwork, old Mr. Vapor's in the church. Polishing the pews, sweeping the floor. <laughs> You'll find the church at the end of the village. Hmm? You want the eggs for the rendezvous de gourmet, hmm? I'm sorry? I, I thought you were from the new restaurant, the main road. I, I had trouble starting the car this morning. I'm from London, Mr. Vefer. I was told that you could help me with an inquiry we have about a wartime movement of German archives. So they sent you. Uh, is there no end to their questions? I've no idea what you're talking about. 1945 again, that's it, isn't it? Yes. I've told you people all I know over and over again. Will it take long? I can't tell at this stage. I came here as a prisoner of war in 1945. I've been here ever since. Always a prisoner in a manner of speaking. You regret it now, do you? Prefer the old country. I've never been back there, Mr... Stuart. Boyd Stuart. <laughs> Mr. Stuart. I imagine you have a car, Mr. Stuart. Yeah. My wife is using our vehicle. Friday is a heavy day. We run a poultry farm, Mr. Stewart. The restaurants, hotels and boarding houses all want our chickens and eggs before the weekend business. It's parked by the lich gate. Boys! Boys, shut up, will you? Franz, you're back early. This is Mr. Stewart. He's come down from London to talk to me. Oh? 
Won't you come in, Mr. Stewart? Thank you. You'll have a cup of tea. Thank you. Uh, take off your coat and sit down, Mr. Stewart. Thanks. Would you like a piece of toast, Mr. Stewart? We don't have any biscuits in the house. Just tea, thanks. Right. I never heard a shot fired in anger, Mr. Boyd. I wore a uniform and saluted my superiors, but most of the work I did in the army could have been done by a civilian. And what was that? When I left school, I worked in the Berlin office of the Hamburg American Shipping Line until I was drafted into the army. After basic training, I became a teleprinter operator. Worked in the telecommunications room with Army Group 6 HQ in Hanover for about a year. Then I went to Zossen. The General Staff Headquarters? Hmm. Its communication room handled every order the German Army ever got. It was a boring job. Everything was in cold. Uh, pour the tea out, Lucy. It's brewed. Here. Thank you. I'll do the milk in. Sugar? <clears throat> no, thanks. Ah, my wife loves that clock. It's a fine piece. Mm. Nothing's too good for that clock. Even the oil has to come from a special shop in Norwich. Only yesterday morning, somebody turned up to replace one of the chimes that had been on order for over two months. Can't stand the sound of that ticking. The damn thing is always slow. From Sassen, I was selected for duty with the signals detachment at the Wolfschanze, the Führer's headquarters in the Black Forest. Well, it was a great honour. You were close to Hitler. Sometimes I would see him every day. It was in February that the signals officer of Hitler's private train, the Führer Sonderzug, went into hospital, and I was assigned to it. Of course, there were drawbacks to the job. Every uniform had to be well-pressed and spotless. No swearing, no smoking. And my communication staff were overworked. I want to know about Hitler's personal documents. I'm trying to discover where they went in the last days of the war. My people say you know about this. Oh, I was with Hitler almost to the end. On Wednesday, March the 21st, 1945, when the news came in that Patton's infantry were entering Ludwigshafen, the Führer sent for me. When we got to the anteroom, I took my pistol from its holster and gave it to the Waffen SS guards. There was a table filled with them, each gun tagged with the name of its owner. <laughs> Even Guderian and the adjutant had to hand over their briefcases for the guards to examine inside and out. Once in the anteroom, I saw all the big brass waiting for the daily conference. There was Keitel, Dönitz, Jodl, and some of Himmler's people. And sprawled in an armchair, looking miserable, I saw Goering himself. I sat on one of the embroidered gilt chairs, feeling out of place. And the study door opened and Gunsche came into the room. Gunsche was Hitler's SS adjutant. Ah, Hitler had dozens of SS adjutants. Gunsche took me through the enormous study with the painting of Bismarck and Hitler's gigantic desk to a side room where they stored documents of the sort the Führer might require at short notice during his daily conferences. It was a small room, and Hitler stood in the middle of it. As I came closer to him, I could smell the medicated sweets he used whenever he had a sore throat. He was a shocking sight. His face seemed to have aged 40 years. He was stooped and seemed to have lost the use of his left arm, which trembled constantly. I'm afraid my face must have registered my horror at his appearance. I, I stood transfixed, giving the Heil Hitler arm upraised. Captain Weffer, I have an important task for you. The enemy is using his heaviest weapons against me in Berlin. There are certain documents that I've decided should not be put at risk and in the interests of history must not be destroyed. I have therefore decided that these documents, which I have personally selected, should be put into safekeeping for future generations. It is a great trust that I place in your hands, Captain Weber. Yes, my Führer. You will leave tonight, using my personal train to go to Frankfurt and mine. There will be cars and an armed escort there to take you onwards. Your exact orders and subsequent destination will be given to you later. You will unseal them on the train. 
the train is stopped or delayed by enemy action, you can call upon whatever resources you require from the appropriate authority. Is that clear, Captain Faber? And there it was. That was my great meeting with the Napoleon of the 20th century. And what had I contributed? Yes, my Führer. So you went back to the train as its sole passenger? You don't understand the devious nature of the higher command. They provided an SS officer to accompany me. The wording of their orders ensured that my role was little more than a baggage porter. It was the SS that would call the tune. Who was the SS officer who went with you? <laughs> don't misunderstand me. The officer was an old friend of mine. He was only a junior rank Obersturmführer, like a first lieutenant. But he was an old-time regular. I'd known Breslau since childhood. He was a decent man. I wanted to visit my parents before we left. I had a feeling I might not see them again. Well, I got out using my day pass, but ran into the guard commander when I returned. He was a pig. But Max Breslau straightened it out. I could have been shot. Ah, Breslau was a Berliner. His mother had been a soprano with a state opera. How far did you get on the train? Oh, we couldn't get beyond Erfurt. A railway bridge was damaged, the engineers said. It couldn't bear the weight of the Führer's train. And the sealed orders? We had opened them on the train. It had been rerouted because of the bombing. Our orders were to take the Führer's personal papers to a salt mine at Merkers in the Thuringia Wald. We got there eventually with the help of two trucks and a platoon of infantry. After a long and acrimonious conversation with a half-witted major who refused to believe we were on a special mission for the Führer. When we got to Merkers, there was no one ready to accept the papers. The yard was muddy and littered with broken boxes and rubbish. There, there was another truck there when we arrived. It contained Reichsbank Director Frank and Reichsbank Prokurist. It was Dr. Frank who signed for our consignment and eventually let us go. And Bresler? He said he wanted to find the nearest Waffen-SS outfit and get back into the fighting. <laughs> At the time, I suspected he was merely looking for some way of changing his SS papers and uniform for those of an ordinary army officer before surrendering to the Americans. And what happened to Hitler's papers? They went down into the mine. I went down into the shaft with Reichsbank Director Frank. I've been through the interrogations and reports about the mine, Mr. Wafer, but I don't recall anyone called Frank. Uh, I, I always suspected that Frank was not his real name. Why? But Breslau was not the sort of officer who would so readily hand those secret papers to a civilian in return for a scribbled receipt. I think... Frank was a Sicherheitsdienst official, and Breslau had special orders to contact him. And Breslau spent a lot of time with Frank, meetings from which I was excluded. And the man who called himself Frank had access to the gold too? And also to all the foreign money that was there. So this gold and foreign currency might have been placed there to finance the escape of the Nazi leaders? All I know is that when the American soldiers arrived at Merkers, Reichsbank Director Frank was nowhere to be found. Did you look at the documents? One of the boxes had come unlocked during the journey. We couldn't help looking. Breslau took one of the typewritten sheets, a report of one of Hitler's daily military conferences, as a souvenir, I suppose. It was a crazy thing to do. And you? I was not a sentimentalist, Mr. Boyd. No. You never did a crazy thing in your life. Oh, excuse me, hmm? Of course. Yes. 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 Damn you and damn the rest of them. For years, no one cared, and now suddenly... You tell them I sent it almost a week ago. Negative, the only negative. Tell them to stop their damn silly games. Is uh, there anything else, Mr. Boyd? Not for the moment. Thank you for helping me. <laughs> There's no alternative. When your people arranged all my permits and permissions, they made it clear they could withdraw them just as quickly. I wouldn't worry too much about that. By now, you're one of us. Think you can find your way? I'll be all right, thanks. Turn right at the Red Fox. And 
And there's the red fox. So I want the road to Great Whitman Gate. Oh my God! It's Vafer's farm. They've got him. bomb in the clock when they fitted the new chime. Nothing much to be done for Wafer. So much for brushing shoulders with Hitler. A safe hidden in the wall. Planning permission for a new chicken house. A passport stamped twice for visits to Berlin. So he was lying about never going back. And he was lying about the documents, too. He did take a souvenir. A Führer copy. Hitler, Goering, Yodel. A GPO receipt for a registered letter to general delivery in Los Angeles. And a photograph taken in some factory yard. Wafer and it must be Max Preslau. Who's this bloke in civilian clothes? Oh, he's written something on the back. Franz, Max, and Dr. Frank. Time I was off. In XPD by Len Dayton, Boyd Stewart was played by Trevor Nichols. Charles Stein, Bruce Boer, Max Breslow, Bernard Hepton, Wefer, Karl Döring, Hitler Minutes, Colin Starkey, Case Officer, Alan Thompson, Vincent, David Garth, Mrs. Breslow, Mary Wimbush, Mrs. Wefer, Anne Jameson, Adolf Hitler, David Sinclair. XPD is dramatised by Michael Bakewell and directed by Peter King. Well, can Agent Boyd discover if a witness to Hitler's treasure mine is telling the truth? You can find out in part four of XPD, The Hitler Minutes, tomorrow. Tomorrow.